Uh, welcome everyone to this new Datadog on episode. Uh, Datadog is a series of live events where we invite engineers and designers and product owners who work every day on building Datadog itself to talk to us about a particular technology they use or a process they follow uh, so we can all learn together. Uh, the episode today, we are going to be discussing how Datadog approaches mobile software development. We have invited two engineers on the Datadog mobile SDK teams, so they are going to share how they uh, build the SDKs that allow you to, um, to monitor your, uh, your mobile applications. Some uh, housekeeping items, this episode is going to be recorded. And all the previous episodes were recorded as well. So if you want to watch any of the previous episodes, you can go to dadoc on dadoc.hq.com. And there also you will see this one being posted in the next in the next few days. We are going to leave enough time at the very end for questions. We love interaction on this episode. This is the, the best part of the Datadoc on uh, episodes, the questions from the audience. So if you have any questions throughout the episode, um, you don't have to wait until the very end. You have a Q&A button on your Zoom client. So click on that uh, Q&A and just type your question, leave it there. And at the very end, we are going to be going through all of them and, and try to answer them. Good. Uh, so some of you may not be familiar yet with Datadog. Datadog is a monitoring and security platform that helps companies improve observability and security of their infrastructure and applications including, of course, uh, mobile applications as well. Um, so my name is Ara Pulido. I'm one of the co-hosts and co-organizer of these events. So if you have any feedback or if you want to tell us about a topic that you would like us to talk about, um, just please uh, reach out and I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions you may have about uh, the event. But the important people today um, are Xavier and Magic. Uh, Xavier, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is uh, Xavier Gouchet. I work in France. Uh, I've been at Datadog for about four years now, mostly working on the Android SDKs uh, and also recently on Roku. And I've been working on Android for all my uh, professional life. Good. Um, Magic? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, my name is Maciek Grzybowski. I work remotely from Poland, Warsaw, uh, senior software engineer in Datadog, almost four years in the company, and I'm specialized in iOS SDK uh, development, being the first person to do Git init commit for iOS project. Good. Uh, welcome both. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so before we, we get started, we always like to give um, a few data about uh, the scale Datadog runs on, because some of the decisions that we make on how we build Datadog and at all the all the services that run Datadog um, are very related to the scale that we run off. So Datadog has more than twenty five thousand customers, and obviously we are a monitoring company. So we basically collect a lot of telemetry from those customers. And if you add up all the hosts and devices uh, from those customers, th those add up to millions of those, which translate of tens of trillions of data points that we have to ingest and process every day. From those trillions of data points, some of them uh, comes from mobile monitoring. And uh, we are going to be, uh, explaining how we build the SDKs that collect that telemetry. But before that, um, I would like Xavier to explain first, what is the problem that we are trying to solve uh, with mobile monitoring? Yeah, so the main issue that we want to uh, solve uh, with mobile monitoring is answering a lot of questions that you might have whenever you publish your application on the store and it starts being used by your customer. You can think, okay, how are the user using my app? Is the new version more stable or less stable? Um, is my app crashing? And if so, why? Uh, what is slowing down my application? And, and so on. There's countless questions that you might want to ask about what's happening to your application once it's uh, released. Um, and this is where uh, we we come in. Um, Datadog, you have uh, when you use your, you're using our SDKs, you can have two instrumentation. The, usually you're going to use the automatic way where you can just say, 
this is what I want to uh, track. And Datadog is going to do everything in the background and track all the data points to give a clear picture of what's happening within your application. But you can also have a fully manual tracking where you can explicitly say, I want to track this particular event. I want to have those attributes in the event at a specific given time, meaning that uh, you give more effort into making sure that you get the data out. But once it's there, it's exactly what you want it to be. And of course, there is a mix in where you can actually have uh, a mix of both. Start with automatic and then add some custom attributes or custom events to have finer control on uh, what you want. So when we talk about RAM real user monitoring, basically we're actually talking about getting information for what's happening to the actual user of your applications out there uh, on their devices. Um, at the top level, we get a few uh, metrics that give you uh, a snapshot of what's happening in your uh, application, whether it's taking a long time to load, it's using too much memory or too much CPU, if there are crashes, or keep following uh, what's happening through deployments of new versions. And of course, you can get information about the demographics that are using the application. But uh, it's not the only thing we do. Uh, we do have an APM correlation. So whenever a network request leaves a phone, we can track that and actually tie it to what's happening in the backend and get a full picture of all of the services contributing to this request. And if something happens, uh, you can actually dig into a specific service to understand why the response was not the one you expected. Uh, finally, because we are tracking things on every uh, user's devices, we can paint a picture of a specific user's journey through the application, meaning we can track uh, which screen they are navigating through. Uh, we can track which uh, buttons, checkbox, text fields they are interacting with. Uh, and of course, we can track the network request, but also the errors that might happen. Um, and talking about errors, Match, I can tell about uh, tracking. Yes, talking about errors, definitely data dock error tracking. So error tracking is about crashes that damage your application and the user experience, but also about uh, errors that are mostly responsible for, for bugs in your, in your code. And by errors, we mean both the errors handled through try and catch uh, syntax, but also ANCAF exceptions, the, the one that occur on Android or Objective-C runtime exceptions. Also custom errors. Whenever some assumption in your code is not met, you can send a custom error indicating some, some problem. Uh, with error tracking, you can browse individual errors, see the stack trace, you can manage new and reoccurring issues, see which version they relate to, uh, what device, what user. These and many other attributes are very useful for you for root cause analysis. So you can see the error in the context of something wider, like the user journey, for example, what steps it leads to a particular error. And speaking about user journey, with uh, this month announcement, we also offer a session replay. So session replay is yet another dimension to uh, to the user journey. Basically, you can see visually what the user is doing in the app, just like you are standing behind their shoulders and watching what they what they do to your product. Uh, with session replay, we target different kinds of audience from product analysts who may wonder, is the business all right? Like, do people understand what we are doing? Uh, to UX designers who may want to validate this versus that variant of the navigation system, for example. Uh, to engineers who, who can leverage this integrated with all the other products like round traces, logs, to see what exactly was happening in the app uh, before something did, did happen. And now all these features are powered by different kinds of telemetry that we that we collect from that our SDKs collect from the uh, mobile app, starting with the views. So basically the screens that are displayed, view controllers on iOS or views in a Swift UI to activities uh, and um, Jetpack Compose structures. Uh, then we have actions. So what exactly, what gestures the user was doing, taps, swipes, also custom actions. Then resources, so network requests happening in the app, uh, errors, crashes, even long tasks, where long tasks stayed for the long lasting operations on the main thread that uh, downgrade the smoothness of the applications in your app. So something important to watch. Uh, then we have basic logs <clears throat> and traces that Xavier already explained it. <laughs> Sorry, and uh, those traces, uh, I, I like it very uh, a lot because traces act as a glue, like 
gluing different layers of your system. So you can really uh, see data correlating from, from different points. And on top of that, we have session replay uh, records um, for transporting the, the, the replay to, to our player. And all this data, all these telemetry kinds, they link to each other. So you can see, for example, uh, you know, on which view the log was collected, or you can see the portion of the session replay that was executed, played right before the crash occurred in your application. Great. Uh, yes, definitely telemetry correlation is one of the key key things in, in Datadog. Um, okay, thanks for that introduction. So now that we know what's the end result of the product that uh, uh, Magic and Xavier are, are helping build in. Uh, let's talk about the, the area where they focus, which is on the SDK that collects all that telemetry. And starting with, with the non-functional goals, because I'm sure when this project started, uh, I, I, these engineers sat down and decided what were the things that, uh, the goals that they wanted to set uh, for the project once it's done. Uh, so where were those, um, Xavier? Yeah, so when we started, uh, the first thing that we knew is that uh, RSDK would live inside other people's applications inside uh, many different uh, variety of devices, um, meaning that we wanted at the at the core of the SDK to be lightweight and performant. We didn't want that um, uh, RSDK be uh, a, a huge weight on top of an existing application. And because most of what we track is making sure that the application is performant. Uh, we wanted RSDK to not degrade those performance, uh, you know, kind of this uh, uh, observer uh, uh, impact. On top of that, obviously we wanted this to be crash-free. Uh, in 2020, uh, there was a famous uh, uh, company that had an SDK that was built into a lot of application on iOS. And one day they changed one thing in the SDK that changed, that basically made all the applications crash on startup, meaning that for a couple of days, a lot of application would crash because of this SDK. And this is a situation that we don't want to be in. So we take all the, you know, from day one, we had all the, the uh, checks in place to make sure we never uh, get there. Finally, of course, we want to we want it to be reliable. The goal is to have uh, metrics and data that's going to be actionable, that's going to be uh, painting the real picture of what's happening uh, on the user's devices, meaning that the data we collect must be as accurate as possible. And there's also a lot of checks in there to make sure we 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 keep this uh, every day. Cool. Thanks. Um, so, based on those non-functional goals. Uh, how uh, we are going to start like diving in how everything was architected to make that happen. Uh, so Xavier, do you want to continue talking a little bit about how we store and upload? Sure. So we can uh, divide what the SDKs do in kind of uh, three main blocks. The first block is collecting the data. And for this, there are many, many tools that we use uh, and we can't get into too much detail. But once the data is captured, uh, basically we go to storage where we're gonna generate and write the data in batch files on disk. And the data is gonna be exactly as it will be sent to uh, our backend. And when we write, we use of course the uh, sandbox folders, meaning that only the application can write and read those folders. So no one can get to this data. Uh, and when we write, we have uh, a, a way to write uh, files either in a temporary folder where uh, basically we don't know yet about the tracking consent. Uh, when you think about GDPR, CCPA, and other privacy laws, um, if we don't know, we just keep that in, in, the, in a pending folder. And once the consent has been given, when we know the data can be sent to Datadog, it's moved to an approved folder. And this storage part is uh, separated from the data collection, but also from the upload. The upload lives in a different thread, and every n seconds, uh, the thread is looking for data that can be sent, so only from the approved folder. Uh, and uh, if uh, all the uh, there is data, if there is network, it's going to send things uh, to the network to the uh, Datadog uh, servers. 
And I talked a bit about the network, and this is something that's very key because we've all been in this kind of situation. Uh, we've all been like, you know, uh, in an underground uh, garage uh, parking lots or in uh, the woods or in, you know, on a train ride and, uh, you know, having no connection. And uh, what we want at the, at the core of the dog is not to lose the data. So because the data is stored on the disk as soon as it's collected, uh, if you don't have the network to send data right now, it's not a problem. We're going to wait until uh, we get network again, and then we're going to send the data, and it's eventually going to reach uh, Datadog. Same thing goes for crashes. If the application crashes, we still have the data, and we can send it uh, when the application goes back up. Cool. Um, yes, I think this offline first uh, thinking when designing web apps is, is critical. Uh, but I wonder, like, if it's okay if you're like 30 minutes uh, in the underground without connection, but what happens if, if suddenly you're offline for many hours, even days, for whatever reason, uh, as soon as you turn on your phone um, or it goes back online, is it going to start sending all that data to Datadog and doesn't that clashes a little bit with the performance part of the known functional goals that we were talking about? No, because we do know how the data, the data backend works. And so the data backend itself has some rules and we're not going to ingest any data that's older than uh, 18 hours. Meaning that uh, when we look at the data we're about to send, we can already tell that the data is older than 18 hours. So in a scenario where you've been you know, offline for a couple of days, we're going to just say, oh, those files are too old. So there's, they, they are not even going to be accepted by Datadog. So it's not worth using the network to do that. So we're just going to discard the file uh, and, and then the data was going to be lost. Same thing, we have a couple of checks in place to make sure that we are good citizen on the device itself, whereas sometimes the, uh, the, avail mem the available memory on disk is going to be um, reduced. And so we try to make sure we don't use too much memory. Uh, so if uh, if we already have a lot of data written on disk, we're going to just discard the oldest one to be able to keep the, the new one. Makes sense. Um, so still on the on the uh, performance uh, and lightweight part of it. Um, when when we were discussing uh, magic, you were describing session replay, and you showed the GIF uh, where you could actually see like a video of the user journey as as really as if you were watching them um this feels like very heavy at least from a user perspective it feels heavy uh, but at the same time we we have clear goals of this being lightweight and performance so how are we solving this yes so session replay first of all it uses exactly this storage and top of system that xavier did explain which is kind of the optimization here as well but speaking about mobile session replay itself. So first of all, we weren't starting from scratch with this project because there is an existing product browser session replay that Datadog offers, which enables you to watch the interaction of the user with the website. So that was the starting point for us. <clears throat> but the very first problem we had to solve uh, was, okay, but how to display mobile UI in the web player? And that was simpler, like to some extent, simpler for, for browser because on both sides you have HTML and CSS. So basically you can record the DOM object and then play the DOM object on the player and apply mutations. Nothing like this on mobile because on one side we have native UI and on the other we have HTML and CSS. So what to do? And what, what we what we initially started with was like simple assumption. Let's let's try to take screenshots every like few seconds and let's see what will happen. And uh, very quickly we realized no, this is not the way because images are very big and transporting sending PNG images or JPEGs compressed JPEGs through through network will be consuming a lot of data. Um, other than this, images are very slow to to capture. Imagine like. <clears throat> full screen iPad uh, application and capturing image on that on the main thread every few seconds. This is definitely not what you want to do. Uh, and last not least, uh, images are not easy for secure data scanning. Like we can imagine the form where user is typing their email and phone number and once we capture image, there is another complexity on finding this text and erasing this before we send it to Datadog. So instead we went with something that we considered lighter uh, and this something is JSON. So 
Speaking about the JSON model that we that we use for session and play, our initial goal was to keep it simple. Like we don't know what we're like struggling with. Let's keep it simple. That's usually the, the best advice. Uh, we started with the basic observation that like everything that is displayed on the mobile UI is either text, shape, or an image. Image, so like the icon or static image in, in your app. And those things can be represented with, with a JSON. Even the image can be encoded using base64 and that's that's good enough. So, based on that observation, we introduced a concept of wireframe as the very minimal visual thing that is presented on a mobile UI. Uh, wireframe itself is just the abstract type. It has some ID and geometry, and this geometry is the position and the size of the wireframe. The wireframe interface again is abstract, so it must be implemented by something. So it's implemented by three concrete types of wireframes: the shape, the very first one. Shape gives some appearance to the geometry defined in the wireframe. So things like background color or the stroke size, or maybe the corner edges. Uh, then we have text. So what words were displayed with what font and what styling. And then we have images that may include the base64 data for the PNG, for example. And now the way it works is that every X milliseconds, and this is 100 milliseconds for iOS, for example, our recorder traverses the tree hierarchy of the mobile app, starting from the very roots of the window object and visiting all the children and the children of children. We are spotting the significant views and producing wireframes for them. Then we jump off to a background thread when we do some additional processing optimizations before we send this data to, to our servers. And here, the JSON model brings us a lot of efficiency. First of all, like it's very light. It's it compresses very well, even the effect of base64 encoded after it's compressed, it's not that visible, it's very much mitigated. Second, it's secure because we read all the text from buttons, labels, navigation bars, etc. It means we can erase this information. We can allow the customer to mask every text in the application. And last not least, it's a diff comp compatible. And this will be display explained it on the on the next example. So here is an example of the button like presented somewhere in the UI. And this button in our wireframe language is composed of two wireframes, one shape wireframe with this purple background and a text rendered on top of it. Each wireframe has an ID and a type and some additional information like the position, shape, style for shape and text styling for, for this type wireframe. As you can see, the text from this button is redacted. There is no button word in the, in the payloads, just six X's that act for a mask. And same applies to passwords, emails, phone numbers, credit card numbers, they're always masked. Now imagine that this button is pressed, so the user is is interacting with this, is hovering the finger on top of it. Because we use wireframes and each wireframe has an ID, we don't need to send the entire wireframe once again. We can send only the update information for that wireframe to, to our server. And here it is like the ID one, which was the shape wireframe, the background color changed from uh, purple to red one. And this is how we apply mutations later on on the player side. Good. Um, so very, very clever solution and indeed non-magic. Um, so, so let's, uh, now that we know more or less how, how everything works at a very high level, let's discuss uh, an elephant in the room when, when people start talking about mobile um, development, which is the ecosystem fragmentation and, and how people can start thinking, uh, what, what are the things that people have to think about when they start developing mobile applications, and in your case, when you started developing the, the mobile SDKs? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, like the mobile come in different shapes and sizes, but even before then, um, there is a, 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 a huge number of ways where you can build uh, a mobile application. You can, of course, go with the native uh, uh, frameworks that are built in by uh, Google for Android and Apple for iOS. But there are also many different cross-platform frameworks that uh, allow you to write once and deploy everywhere, like React Native or Flutter, and so much more. And even when you choose a specific framework or platform that you want to build, uh, you can still choose a different language. Uh, on Android, for example, you have Java and Kotlin. On iOS, you have Objective-C and Swift, and so on. So, so many options to choose from. Even when you've chosen a platform, a language, 
you can still have lots of libraries to use to build the UI, but also to do all sorts of stuff that we're going to want to track eventually. Um, one uh, funny thing is that there's always new ways to to uh, build mobile application that we don't know of. Um, once we had a customer approach us and uh, wanting to know if we add something compatible with Qt. And Qt is a C++-based uh, desktop app framework. So it's usually built used to build a Linux application, but it has a way to export also mobile apps, which we didn't know. Um, and of course, even though uh, even with the JVM, the CNJS uh, being so much uh, uh, inter interoperable, uh, there are so many languages you could choose to build into any of the supported frameworks. So uh, very early, we had to think about making sure what we would build would be generic enough that it could be usable even if uh, people didn't use the vanilla uh, default way of building the app for Android and iOS. And once we had that, we started to think about, of course, the fragmentation of devices. Um, uh, devices can come in many sizes, um, can use different sort of chips, uh, and not even talking about the Android diversity. Uh, because Android is open sourced, uh, any manufacturer can change the OS of Android and adapt it to their needs. So when you think about Samsung, LG, and so on, uh, all those uh, manufacturers is, are going to build phones that are going to be different, even though they are still all of them Android. And those differences sometimes uh, can be can impact the way an application behaves. Uh, on top of that, we have to think about form factors. Uh, at the beginning, we were mostly targeting phones, but then we had to expand what we did to support also tablets, uh, TVs, but also uh, points of sales. Um, points of sales is a very tricky thing because um, it's essentially a screen in a retail store or a restaurant where people can start, you know, ordering or asking some questions. Um, and the thing is that uh, we had some customers with point of sale devices, uh, which would be always plugged in uh, to uh, electricity and they didn't have any battery. Uh, but the thing is that in Android, when we request uh, the battery level, those devices, because they would tweak the OS, would respond, oh, the battery level is zero. And when the battery is low enough, uh, we stop sending events to make sure we don't drain the battery even further. That's part of us being you know, lightweight and be being you know, good citizen in the uh, end user's devices. So we had to tweak our SDKs to make sure we would be still compatible with those specific devices. Then, of course, we have the uh, OS versions. Any mobile engineers know that you know uh, there are still lots of uh, versions of Android and iOS that are still in use out there. And uh, because we want to uh, support as many uh, users as possible, uh, we try to be uh, compatible to very old uh, versions of the OS uh, out there, but also try to support the latest one whenever they get out, meaning that uh, sometimes we have to tweak our code. Um, imagine that we're writing a feature that's using an older um, API that's become deprecated. Then we have to try to find alternatives to, to do the same thing using newer uh, um, um, newer APIs that are available in more recent uh, uh, versions of the OS. Uh, and the other way around, of course, if we want to do something, uh, a new feature, and we know that it's supported in the latest version of iOS, but not in the previous one, we have to find ways to, to get something similar, uh, even though it's not always uh, easy. Uh, but for that, we try to match the official recommendation from Apple, Google, uh, and we we try to support all the versions that uh, uh, our customers can target when they publish applications on the store. And so when we have uh, something that's ready, uh, the SDK is working uh, and tested, uh, eventually we have to publish it so that our customers can use it. And even then the fragmentation, the fragmentation is still an issue because uh, for Android, mostly we have Maven. Uh, for React Native, we have NPM. For uh, Flutter, we have pub.dev. Uh, but sometimes we have some customers that want some specifics. Um, a customer approached us that uh, didn't want to use Maven because of security uh, uh, policy in their company. And so we had to send them the AAR file, which is basically the archive, the Android archive five, a zip file, essentially. Doing that, we had to also give them a list of all the dependencies that our SDK is using to make sure that you, they would get the 
relevant AARs also, otherwise the SDK would not work. And on iOS, we ran into even more trouble that Magic can tell you more about. Yeah, so this fragmentation is very visible on, on, on iOS. And it is uh, it is not a pleasure to distribute a, a SDK through iOS distribution channels because there are four uh, main distribution methods. So Swift Package Manager, uh, CocoaPods, Cartage, and binary distribution like XE frameworks. And they all together make up two uh, streams of distribution, two methods of distribution, I would say, the source code distribution and the binary distribution. And that brings a challenge because not only our binary must be compatible with different apps and their setups, their runtime and linking linking methods, but also the code that we provide must compile on the end user machine, so on the developer machine. And that includes the Xcode version compatibility, Swift version compatibility, uh, but also the compatibility with uh, certain version of CocoaPods, Cartage, and so on. Indeed, it doesn't seem like a, like an easy task. Um, so we, we, we've we talked a lot about uh, being performant when we're talking about session replay or dealing with uh, networking, etc. Uh, but how how are you testing? How are you making sure that actually the SDKs are performant? So th this is a question of quality assurance. So what we do before shipping the code to production to make sure it's the quality, uh, the quality is in there. So we diff we divide our uh, delivery process into three segments. First of all, there is a development period where we work on new features, bug fixes, optimizations, and so on. And here, like classics, we leverage different kinds of testing from integration from units to through integration to end-to-end uh, -end testing. Uh, interestingly, this is where we can leverage Datadog CI visibility product a lot. And Datadog CI visibility is gives us an aggregated look into the execution of our tests. So we can see on a long term uh, what are different test statuses like success, fail, how many of them there are, what's the duration of tests in average, and if there are a new flaky test spotted. That helps us a lot to move forward and ensure everything is tested. Uh, other thing in during development is is benchmarks. So from time to time we do manual benchmarks with different open source applications just to measure the overhead of the of the SDK, and to avoid the observer problem that Xavier announced earlier. Uh, we we typically do two types of measures. One with Without using our SDK, we collect several profiles on the app, different measures, and then we put our SDK in, enable all the features, and we repeat the measures. So by comparing the new measure with the baseline, we know more or less what is the overhead uh, that our SDK is adding. To improve these benchmarks, we even think about using mobile synthetics product. With mobile synthetics, we can run automated UI tests on real devices, uh, constant, continuously, so this is some opportunity for us to optimize, automatize this work. Uh, but after development, but before production, we try our products, our SDKs, the new versions in our dog footing channels. And here we have two dog footing channels. First of all, iOS and Android apps for Datadog, the ones that you can find in App Store and Google Play Store to interact with Datadog platform. We install our recent versions of SDKs in those apps, and this way, uh, our mobile app team can leverage visibility that the SDK is bringing, and we can have some nice dog footing experience to further ensure that we what we are about to ship to production is is secure and is uh, optimal. Another distribution, uh, another dog footing channel is the Shopis environment. So Shopis environment is is very interesting. It's made from real mobile applications, real website, and real backend infrastructure. Uh, everything is instrumented with, with Datadog. And this environment, it simulates a real e-commerce business. So selling furniture online, something like this. And everything, all the technology, all the stack is real, but data is fake. So this environment, we use it for uh, at Datadog. We use it mainly for uh, presentation purpose. So whenever you see us on conference, meetups, uh, webinars like this, or we do some online demos, very likely we'll be using Shopee's environment to present you the full power of Datadog using some real environment. And for us within our team, this environment gives us continuous integration of our nightly version. So 24 by 7 automated UI tests do run our SDK, the scenarios in those app, and we send some data 
and additional data doc monitors uh, observe is if the volume of data is is correct. Uh, that lets us to allows us to spot issues early. And last, once after we deploy things to production, we still maintain some certain level of visibility to the performance of, of our SDK. And this is thanks to remote telemetry. Remote telemetry in a nutshell, it's logs and metrics related to Datadoc SDK itself, like something to monitor how we perform. And speaking about remote telemetry in, in more detail, this, this is the high level setup. Imagine this setup where different customer apps send their data to their Datadoc instances. And this data is logs, traces, RAM, errors, crashes, and so on. Once every, once every while, among this data, our SDK will insert some, may insert some telemetry events. So some information about the performance of, of this, of this uh, SDK. For example, some error in the SDK logic or some additional debug information to uh, surface some previous problem or maybe configuration even because we want to analyze and understand the usage of our SDKs. So when, once all this data arrives to the Datadoc instance of our customer, only the telemetry information, telemetry data is forwarded to our specific uh, telemetry is the telemetry organization, telemetry instance. So this is where we leverage the full power of Datadog to, to inspect problems, fix them, observe, and do regular typical monitoring that we can we can do with, with our platform. And two important things about this remote telemetry system. First of all, all the telemetry data is anonymized. So no application information or no user information enters our uh, monitoring organization everything stays in your org uh, and this feature is totally opt out so it's optional you can opt it out whenever you want and do not share any data telemetry data with with that doc good um yes it's 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 good to see that uh basically all Datadog engineers use Datadog itself as well <clears throat> to improve to improve Datadog, which is very meta and very cool to see. Um, good. Another thing that uh, that we, we want to discuss that is, I think is very, very specific to mobile applications uh, is the application lifecycle. I think the application lifecycle for mobile, uh, it's very different for desktop applications or obviously backend applications. But why... Uh, having a clear view of, of that life cycle, uh, it's so important in particular to, to build the SDKs and, and Xavier can, can uh, dive deep here. Yeah, definitely. So the, the thing to, to keep in mind is that uh, a mobile device is very multitask oriented. You're always switching between applications. You're opening your application uh, to track your, uh, your uh, jogging and then you switch to uh, to your messaging and then you switch to a video, you switch to a game, you're always switching between apps all the time during the day. Meaning that uh, whenever something happens, uh, we need to keep track of that and keep the data uh, so that we can you know, give it to our customers. Um, the first thing that we track is whenever the application is launched. Um, we have the application startup time, and the startup can be either be cold or warm. Um, what we call a cold startup time is uh, basically the application is not uh, alive. The process does not exist on the OS, and the user clicks on the icon on the home screen. When it does uh, that, then the OS is going to start the process for your application. The application is going to start you know, preparing, loading a couple of stuff, uh, maybe loading a few libraries, making some requests to the network uh, before eventually showing the first screen that the user can interact with. And so this cold start is something that we can track because we know when the process is started uh, and we know when the first view is visible. Um, compared to that, we have the warm start, which is the application is already alive because you've used it, you've used it in the past uh, and you just switch to something else. And then you switch back to the application. In that case, basically there's nothing really to load. It's just the application just being brought back to the front. And in this case, we can't really track that because we don't get from the OS any signal that says, oh, the user wants to come back to the application that is already there. Uh, meaning that we know when the application is visible. We don't know when the, the decision from the user started. Uh, and there is this uh, weird bug we had on iOS 15 where the OS would 
start to uh, applications on its own beforehand without the user asking just to warm them up so that when the user actually wants to go there, it would think, oh, this application loads fast. Um, and we had to review how we track the, the startup time because customers would come to us and say, oh, my application is loading, it's taking two days to load, uh, where in fact it didn't really. Once the application is alive, uh, of course, I mentioned that you're switching back and forth. So eventually your application is going to go in the background. Uh, but the thing is that when the application is in the background, so you're switching to a messaging app or to answer a phone call, uh, it can still perform operation because it can still, you know, sync with the, uh, with the server or it can, you know, download some stuff. Um, and this is still information that our customers might want. So what we're doing essentially is that we're in the, you know, the uh, ROM uh, uh, architecture, um, we create a fake virtual view that is gonna hold all the events happening in the background. This is opt-in of course, um, so people have to ask for it, but basically we can have those uh, keeping track of what's happening when the application is not visible to user, the user, but you still want to know if there's too much network request or if an error occurs. Finally, something that you don't want to have uh, in an application is a crash, but of course it does happen. And crash handling is a very, very tricky thing to do because uh, when the crash happens, whether it's on iOS and Android, um, when we learn about the crash, the, the, the process is just about to end. And we just have a few milliseconds to deal with the information. And we have to deal with the information when the process is in an unstable state. Uh, when we get something, basically, you can assume that something's wrong with the memory or something wrong with uh, any object that you may want to read. Um, so what we do is basically we write on the disk, as soon as we know, we write the crash dump as well of all the known RAM context and device meta metadata. So we know if the device is online or not, uh, we know uh, the battery level and stuff like that. So we try to write as much stuff as we can on disk. And then when the application restarts eventually, we read those crash dump and context and metadata, and we build from that a crash report and update the session and that we send to uh, data out eventually. And of course, all of this still uses the features of separating the data collection, storage and upload that I mentioned earlier, meaning that we, we have to do to act fast when we know the crash is happening and then we let the process crash and eventually we restart the, when the application restarts, we can uh, actually send the information. Awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks for explaining that and how we are getting those crash reports, even though the application actually crashed. Um, so uh, when, when talking about mobile development, uh, a concern for developers obviously is private and compliance. Uh, this is privacy and compliance is something that no matter what you're doing in software development, you have to think about, but it feels like in, in mobile development is even more critical uh, because you're collecting data from a device that it's always with the user and have a lot of private information. So how are we dealing with that on, on the SDKs? Magic. Yes. So there are four big elements, I think, in, the, in this equation. So first of all, in some regions like EU, developers are obliged to collect the consent information from the user, like whether or not they want to share their data with uh, with another uh, with another organizations. And this thing we facilitate it with so-called tracking consent API. So with this consent API that you need to set early when initializing the SDK and you can change later, you need you can decide whether data can be collected or sent or not. And typical use case, typical scenario is you start the SDK with the pending value and pending means collect the data, but do not send it. And after this, you present a pop-up or part of configuration screen for your user asking them for, for the consent. And depending on what they say, you may want to change it to granted so that all data is uploaded and the next data is collected, or you can change it to not granted, meaning we'll wipe out all the data and we won't be recording anything anything uh, further. Uh, going next, 
before any data is sent from our SDK to, to our servers, you are given a chance to redact or drop this information with even mapper APIs. So with those mapper APIs, you can intercept every single log uh, span or RAM event, see what is inside, eventually redact some sensitive information that could be there in your URL, for example. Uh, so you can change it or you can drop the event entirely and do not send it. Mm. Going next, some regulations can enforce additional data data encryption uh, requirements. So for that, we offer encryption at REST API. You can configure custom encryption for writing and reading data by our SDK. And we will conform to this and we will use it to save any information uh, on a user device and decrypt it when we'll be reading it be right before, before the upload. And last, not least, but there are two main elements uh, related to this in session replay. So first of all, like I said before, all sensitive text, texts are must. That includes password, emails, phone, and credit card numbers. And there is no way to override this. Like this, we don't want to collect this data and it will be always erased. And on top of that, we offer three different privacy levels. So you can decide what to do with other kinds of text in, in session reply, like either mask everything, mask the text that user inputs through mask user input setting, or maybe allow all the text to be to be recorded. And yes, on top on top of that, like Datadoc as a platform offers even more so like other capabilities. And here just to name fuse, a sensitive data scanner in a log pipeline. So you can use regular expressions or some predefined rules for erasing more information from your logs. Uh, retention policies, because no data lasts forever, you can decide how long data should be stored in Datadog, and even role-based access control, so you can decide who has access to which portion of, of your data. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for explaining privacy, which I think is, is a concern of many. Um, but uh, I wanted to also mention, uh, and Shavir can, can go explain a little bit further why we do this, that our SDKs are actually open source. So people not only can see in this in this episode how we build it, but actually can look at the code. Uh, so Shavir, do you want to go um, to explain why? Why is that? Sure. So the main thing is that this is something that we do uh, on all the projects uh, um, that uh, live in our customers' uh, backend uh, in Datadog. And it's even more important for uh, the mobile SDKs because it's not just living in our customers' backend, but it's living on their customers' devices. Um, the SDKs are mostly open source for transparency, of course, because we want our customers to know what we are doing in, in their backend and inside their application, but also for an audit, like we had customers coming back to us and say, hey, in this uh, in this uh, metric, you're using this method, uh, you, should, you should use this one, which is gonna be much more uh, performant. And of course, for tweaking opportunities, I mentioned that sometimes uh, customers have very specific use cases and we want to uh, them to be able to adapt the SDK to their uh, use cases if we don't do this out of the box. And the good thing is that because it's open source, we've had more than 100 external contributions, uh, either in bug reports or feature requests, which is uh, all also visible on our GitHub repositories, but also sometimes with pull requests, which are very, very nice to uh, get, especially when the, 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 the engineers uh, contributing make uh, a real effort to make the things uh, uh, as uh, with as much uh, um, uh, effort as we do. And of course, because we're part of the open source community, we do share also uh, pull requests on projects that uh, we use or that, I, that are close to what we're doing. Uh, we've been contributing to the React Native project or the Expo project, which is built on top of React Native and the Roku community tools for people writing Roku uh, channels uh, for TVs. Good. Um... That's fantastic. And what, what would you be your recommendation for people who, who think about contributing to, to these projects? So the main uh, advice is to start reading what we have, of course, in our repositories. Uh, each repository has a contributing guide, which allows you to uh, know how to set up your uh, laptop, for which idea to choose and how to start running the test and how to run uh, the sample applications uh, for each of the projects. And then, of course, if you have some you know, uh, issues or if you're looking for something that we don't do already, you can open a feature request or uh, a bug report.
But also, if you think that you have some usage that might benefit other people, you can submit a pull request and even look through past uh, feature requests that are not there yet and say, oh, I'm going to try and tackle this one. This is always uh, appreciated. Fantastic. Um, OK, so we are going to go for questions. Uh, but before going to, to questions, we've covered a lot of things about mobile software development. Uh, Xavier, what, what would be your, your takeaway? So pe things yeah. people need to, to, to think about. OK, so very, very quickly. Uh, Mobile specific, the key takeaways is keep in mind of the fragmentation. Not everyone has the latest mobile phone. Not everyone uh, has a, a, a mobile phone. It could be IoT, it could be TV, it could be something else. Um, think offline first because um, network is not always there available or reliable. And think about all the way people can use what you're building. Whether you're building an app or an SDK, users will find a way to use what you built in ways you didn't think of. Um, general advice from engineering uh, perspective is to test, 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 and test. Uh, test in production or test uh, locally, use all the tests you want. Try to measure things because if you want things to be more performant, you first need to have a measure of how it's behaving to have a comparison. And finally, uh, because mobile is ubiquitous, everyone has one in there uh, in their pocket. We want to make sure that everything we do is uh, mindful of the privacy of the people using the application or SDKs. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now, and I'm going to go through the questions that we have from the audience. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll start with this one from Valentin. Thanks, thanks for uh, sending that over. I see that session replay on mobile is on public beta. How do you deal with the fact that Apple has purposely forbidden apps from recording the screen without explicitly telling the user about it when it's happening? It's because the escape records JSON and not video, it's okay? I think probably this one is for you, Magic. Yes, I, I can take this one. To uh, yes, indeed, session replay is still in beta. And during the beta, this is something we, like, to be honest, haven't yet looked into into much details. Uh, we have some plans for preparing answers to questions like this, also to provide the manifest that Apple requires for describing the, the tracking strategy and all these elements. But I think the like high level answer for B could be yes, indeed, there is something in the fact that we record JSON representation of the screen, not the actual screen capture. So what we do is far from recording the video of the user using the application. We basically transform the screen representation into our arbitrary format with erasing as much as we can as and as much as you want as a, as a user of session replay product out of it. So we think that this will be possible to find the balance between what we record uh, and fulfill the Apple requirements. And on top of that, if, if the requirement is to inform the user, more likely this will be something that uh, app developers should, should prepare the, the, the app for. Good. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question about APM correlations. So Nate uh, is asking, my company uses head-based sampling to limit the amount of traces we consume. So is there a way to configure my RAM application so that all the downstream traces will actually be captured? So I can take this one. Uh, basically, we have uh, sampling that's going to be happening um, on the mobile device directly, meaning that uh, you can, when you use the SDK on a mobile app and or in iOS, you can say, oh, by the way, the sampling that's going to be correlated, that's going to you know, start a trace that's going to be propagated to the backend. Uh, I want it to be uh, a sample, like I only want 20% of the request or 5% of the request. And basically because the request starts from the mobile, the mobile is going to decide how much of it uh, is going to be taken. And so because of the headers we 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 sent, uh, the backend is going to be uh, uh, respecting this as well, meaning that we can say, hey, we don't want this to, to be tracked. It's not going to be tracked. We, don't, we want this to be tracked. It's going to be tracked. OK, thank you. Um... Someone, Anonymous, uh, ask uh, what kind of information will developers have access to if the user asks the app not to track the session? And I guess the answer is... Uh, well, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> no. Yes. And, uh, and that's that's the right thing to do, yeah. obviously. I mean, basically, that's, that's, that's what the tracking consent is there for. So if, if, so on the SDK side, we don't track this, and we don't 
have any UI to ask the customer. But basically, uh, when the developers initialize the SDK and and updates information, we 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 get this and we we respect it to the letter. So if the 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 customer the developer says uh, the user doesn't want to be tracked well we stop everything meaning we don't even write things on the disk we don't send anything and we just kind of you know pause the uh, the SDK uh, until uh, either the user changes their mind or until the app you know uh, stops sounds good um, okay so Ayan is asking about uh, bandwidth limited environments so they they ask can you provide controls where we can set up an upper limit on the upload speed? We would absolutely want to trade off productivity of upload speed for a bit of more latency in having access to those replays. No, this is about um, mobile mobile station replays. So uh, I think it's in general. I think yeah, uh, it's up yeah. upload information in general. Generally speaking, because session replay shares the same storage and tuple system with, with other products. We have several options for configuring the, for shaping the size of network requests and the frequency of network requests that uh, that our SDK will be, will be doing. So yes, as a, as a customer, as a developer, you can configure the pace and the size of network requests that SDKs uh, send to our servers. Good. Um... So um, a question about lightweight. Um, so Dan is asking, uh, you said this is the case lightweight and small. Do you have any numbers on how much larger the app can get by including the SDK? Uh, we do have a few numbers. Um, and I guess the answer is going to be different on Android and iOS. Uh, on Android, uh, because the SDK is also relying on some um, um, libraries, um, the overhead in terms of size is going to be different depending on which library your application is already using. Uh, for instance, we are using OKHTP, but most applications are using OKHTP anyway, meaning that that part of the of the overhead is not going to be visible because we're not adding something new. So we do have some numbers. Uh, I think we're uh, under one meg. Uh, and of course, it's also a matter of which feature you're using. Uh, if you're only using RAM and not the rest, it's going to be much smaller than if you're using RAM plus logs, plus station replace, plus uh, tracing. So there's, yeah, the answer is going to be, it depends. <laughs> and on iOS, my check, do you want to take it? Uh, I don't know the numbers by heart, but uh, recently we've been measuring the, the size of session replay module itself and what we computed by producing two APA files, one is session replay, another without, like there was less than 300 kilobytes difference. So it, it's this for the session replay module itself. And I think it stays similar with other projects. So once you use everything could be well, definitely less than two megs. So one of the things that, that, that I get from, from this answer is that, uh you can select which things you want. So you can, if you're not going to get everything, if you're not going to use it. Starting from SDKs 2.1, 2.0, sorry, uh, released earlier this month. Yes, you can selectively include RAM, but not session replay or vice versa, lock trace, everything is separate. And to yes. add on top of that, the, the, the build tools that we have uh, both on both platforms are going to also do some optimization. So if there are parts of the SDKs that you don't use, even if you're you know, including it, uh, um, some, some, some parts that you don't use are going to be stripped off, meaning that the ending size is going to be very a lot depending on what you use. Good. Um, there is a question by Anonymous Attendee uh, on specifically on React Native. And, and how you, you oh, can use session. Yeah, the question is how to enable session replay in React Native. Right now, you can't. <laughs> the best uh, you can do is to wait. Uh, yeah. This is something we, we plan to do in the future, but right now we only support uh, iOS and Android uh, native uh, system only. Sounds good. Um, uh, I don't know if I understand this question, but maybe you do. Is there a list of attributes captured by the SDK for various features? 
Uh, yes, um, there is. We, we document historic stuff. Like we, we document it online. So uh, real user monitoring the mobile part of RAM documentation on our online documentation, you'll see the full list of uh, what data is collected as part of uh, RAM events. Stuff. if you want to add something. Yeah, mostly the thing is that the everything that we collect out, out of the box is only going to be technical information. So we're going to gather, for instance, the name of the UIV controllers in iOS, the activities and fragments in Android. We're going to gather the uh, network uh, status. So uh, is the network available? Is it Wi-Fi or 3G, 4G, Edge? Uh, you name it. Um, and, and, and basically that's, kind of the range of technical information we're going to gather um, uh, for actions. Uh, we're going to gather the uh, identifier of the buttons that the user interact with, but that's all That's all the information that we can track out of the box. On top of that, of course, you can add custom, like I mentioned, you can manually add uh, information that's relevant to your business. So uh, you might want to say, oh, this is my the ID of my user in my system. Uh, which we don't know, but we can't know. So you can add it and attach it to the sessions. You can attach information relevant to what the user is doing to uh, some information that you're uh, inter interested in on the device with Bluetooth or GPS or anything else. Um, but all of those is something that you need to actually add to what we track automatically. Okay, uh, we're still getting questions. So thanks thanks a lot for, for that. Um, so we have a question about cross-reporting. Uh, do we support handling symbols files that are obfuscated? Yes. Uh, so on both platforms, so um, on Android, we do uh, we do support uh, handling obfuscation with ProGuard, uh, meaning that we have a plugin for Gradle where you can upload uh, the program mapping file, uh, and when you when you are looking at the crash in Datadog, uh, all the all the stack trace is going to be uh, deobfuscated. Uh, and on iOS, similarly, we can send the sims, meaning that when you look at the stack trace, you're going to have the uh, stack trace fully simulated. Uh, and we do provide also a link to GitHub. So basically, um, if your project is stored on GitHub or GitLab, um, when you're looking at a stack trace, we can have a link that takes you to the actual file, correct line, correct commit that generated um, uh, the crash. Good. Um, so question for you, Magic, because this is for iOS. Are there any constraints in tracking a UI built with Swift UI? Of course there are. Uh, yes. And <laughs> this is part of our uh, beta, beta period. So for now on, like we, we don't yet support Swift UI. Uh, our offering with session replay is purely focused on UI kit and all these like classic ways and not classic like the uh, major major ways of, of doing QIs. Uh, Swift UI brings additional challenge because uh, like I was explaining before, our approach is based on traversing the view tree view hierarchy. And while this is simple and quite obvious for UI kit, because all the views are objects in a hierarchy and we can traverse it, it's not that obvious for Swift UI. There is still some kind of a view tree, but this one is more abstract. And most importantly, it's much more ambiguous. We don't know exactly what the certain elements are in this view tree, which means we need to kind of adjust and align our strategy towards capturing Swift UI views. Uh, but we have some ideas in, in our head, and this is something totally uh, that we consider supporting in near future. Okay, uh, and follow up on this on Android. So just a question that just came about capturing compose based UI. Yeah, so it's a similar kind of kind of answer. Uh, right now, we mostly support uh, XML based on Android, and it's still be there for session replay. Uh, we do we did start to do some uh, you know uh, exploration of how we could track compose, but we're not there yet uh, actually um, because again um, we're we don't have and hierarchy of objects that we can, uh, you know, get, grab and and convert into the wireframe. So um, the good thing is that uh, because Kotlin is very, you know, uh, permissive and big because of the uh, way the the tool chain works, there are some options that we're considering that might be helpful to uh, to track these very very easily without too much uh, hassle on on the uh, including this on an existing project. 
That's good. Um, something about uh, how we, uh, whether we, we capture location, is the location is captured through G GPS or IP address? And is there any way to control granularity of the location to general visibility of city instead of exact location? So we do not use the GPS at all. We don't require the permission for uh, uh, requesting the location on the devices, neither on Android and iOS. Um, we only use uh, IP address, and this is now an opt-out feature. So when you start uh, creating your projects in Datadog, uh, you have checkboxes to say, oh, I don't want to see the IP. So if you don't want it, you can disable it. So nothing is tracked on the device itself. It's when we upload the data to Datadog that the servers look at the IP address and use geolocation. And because this is just IP address uh, based location, uh, the granularity is at most uh, on a CD, but usually it's um, uh, like the, depending on when you, where you are, the CD is very, very uh, fuzzy. Um, I know that when I uh, use uh, my phone on uh, in the countryside uh, in France, uh, the, the the way uh, my ISP works is that sometimes uh, I'm located in a city that's not close at all to where I actually am. So usually it's more the area that's very relevant uh, to give a big picture of where the users are coming from. And, and this is useful to know if, for instance, uh, people in a specific country or area are seeing more errors than others or seeing slower downloads than others. Okay, good. Um, so we are already over time, so I think we can we can leave it uh, here. Uh, thanks a lot, Xavier and Magic, for uh, sharing your knowledge, uh, and thanks everyone for attending and and asking all those great questions. Again, this is going to be recorded, so watch out uh, for that, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.